So we, over the last couple of weeks, we've had the amazing privilege of Pastor Neil, Pastor Tom, Mark, and even Alan talk about faith. And I felt like God's been stirring it in my heart to talk more about faith. And something that God's been showing me is almost like a recipe for faith that we can apply to the different season or the different circumstance that we're facing ourselves in. And as I was reading this, I just got so stirred in my spirit and I knew that God really wanted to share this. And I feel like there's people here that have been going through something and they've been doing this day in, day out, but they have seen nothing. They've seen nothing. But I want to say to you, Jesus is coming for that situation. I feel like there's people that are on the brink of giving up, that they've just, they just want to give up. They don't want to do this anymore. But yet I can tell you that Jesus wants to come into that situation. I feel like there's people here that are expecting a healing, but yet they, they've been searching for Jesus and not finding it and haven't received that healing. But I just want to say, I feel God stirring me in my heart to say, this will be the day to give you and put your faith into what you're expecting because God wants to answer all the prayers that you've been praying, all the times that you've been in that secret closet and that you haven't been getting what you've been expecting. And God says that there's going to be breakthrough for you today. And before we start getting into the word, let us just pray and honor the King of Kings. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing, amazing, majestic name. You are the God above gods. You are the name above names. And Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross, that now we can have reconciliation and have relationship with the Father. All thanks to you by shedding your blood on the cross. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you'll move. I pray that you anoint my words today, Father, to, to hit your bride and to penetrate into the hearts of the many. And God, everything that is of you, let it grow and flourish. And everything that is of me, let it just fall away right now in Jesus' name. So if you guys have a Bible, or if you have the Bible app, turn with me to Luke 5. We're going to hug in this chapter for a little bit. And everyone knows this chapter so, so well. This is a great chapter, and I feel like God was showing me the little versions of faith that we can have for our different circumstances. So this is like a mini sermon in mini sermons. And we all know this story. Simon Peter was by the lake, and... He was going to, let's say, give up. He had his nets and he was washing them. People who were around were listening to the word of God and he saw in the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. Now this is that word, they've, they've tried something. They're, they're washing it, they're, they're washing it away. They're trying to, to give up. They're trying to, to throw it all away at this moment. But Jesus is coming. That's when they said, Jesus is coming. Can everyone say that Jesus is coming? <laughs> he got into one of the boats belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little. Now, this is why I feel like God was stirring in my heart. He's asking Simon to just do something small. Just put out a little. Do something small for me so that I can do something later. I feel like God was saying that it's just something small. Maybe it's just going to your prayer closet. Maybe it is blessing someone, as Tom was talking about before, that, that giving something so small, that's so easily done, but requires that little faith to just simply just do it. And then when he put out a little from the shore, Jesus sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. See, God first asked Simon to do something small, so then he could trust him in doing something greater. It says in Luke 16.10 that those that have given little and been trusted in little can be trusted with much, and those that have been or unworthy or disloyal in little cannot be tr or will be disloyal in much. So God is painting this little picture when you're trusted in that little. All Peter had to do was let Jesus use his boat and push it out from the shore to something simple, but then for him to cast him out into the deep, to push it out into the deep and to get a catch. This is that moment where maybe you've been doing those little things. Maybe you've been praying. Maybe you've been seeking God for that circumstance, and you just feel like you've been trying and trying and trying and getting nowhere. You haven't caught anything. Because Peter's first answer is, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught a thing. Some people say that first response is disbelief, but it's actually factual. Peter has worked all night. He is a fisherman. 
So maybe you have tried something all week, all night, maybe all month, maybe even all year. Maybe you've been trying something, but it's been in your own strength. Maybe you've been toiling and laboring and, and trying to see breakthrough, trying to catch something, and, and you've just done it all night, and now you're at the point where you're like, you know what, I just want to wash my nets. I can't do this. I didn't catch a thing. And then he has this realization, but, everyone say but. Do you know God likes big butts? Because he cannot lie. <laughs> I knew Tom wouldn't. Tom, I'm sorry I had to do it. God is not a man that he shall lie. <laughs> but, see, Peter had a realization of who he was talking to. He realized the person that he was talking to. He was talking to Jesus. And he had heard the words that Jesus had spoken, the authority and the power that he had. So when he had this realization of who was speaking to him, he then realized that he should do the task that was set before him. See, that's when he said, because you say, I will let down the nets. And friend, I'm telling you now today that Jesus wants you to let down your nets for a catch. Because maybe you've been trying, and but maybe you've been doing it in your own strength. Maybe you haven't heard from the Lord, but now the Lord wants to say, let down your nets. Go into the deep and get a catch. Because as soon as he did that, that when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Their nets began to break because of the catch was so big. So that's exactly like Ephesians 3.20 when God says he'll do exceedingly abundantly more than we can think or ask because God is a good father. And then as soon as he's got the word of the Lord, that's when the Lord had stuck to his promise. He said that he would let down his nets and get a catch. See, God is not a God that he would lie. But you can see there's a little formula. Peter first had to listen to the word of the Lord just to do something little. Do something little in his life. Maybe God's telling you to evangelize to that person that's been sitting there and you know that you could share a word with them, but you're just too frightened. Maybe that's that little thing that God's been prompting you to do, but you just haven't done it yet. Maybe it's the simple thing of just walking up to someone and telling them about Jesus. Maybe it's simply just giving someone some money, helping someone out. You don't know until God unveils, until you ask God to reveal it to you. See, the little thing, now you're trusted. God knows that you're diligent because God's all about stewardship. He wants to see what we can be trusted with. He gives us little so then first then we can get be given much. So then he knows that we are trustworthy. He wants to see that we're trustworthy so that when Peter finally obeyed the word of the Lord and did the little thing for the Lord, then God was able to use him now and say, put out into the deep and now you'll get your catch. See, Simon Peter had a need. He needed fish. He needed fish. He saw Jesus. He obeyed what Jesus said. So he surrendered his need to God without knowing, even though he knew who he was talking to. See, he had an obedience to put his net out into the deep. See, when we look at this scripture without context, it just seems pretty nice. Like, yeah, of course Simon Peter would put out his net in the deep. He's talking to Jesus. But see, Simon Peter was a fisherman. He knew everything about the sea. He knew the way it worked, and he didn't get anything. And then for a rabbi to come and say, put your nets out just there. And he's like, what do you mean? I've been going out. I've been doing everything. I've gone over to that sea. I know where all the good spots are. And you're telling me, just go right there? So we don't know that Simon Peter probably even had a disbelief straight away. And maybe even when I speak to you and I'm saying all you have to do is that something little, maybe the first thought that you're having is not unbelief, but it's going straight to the thing that Simon Peter did. But I've done that. I've done it. What do you mean I've done it? Well, I haven't seen anything. But have you heard from the Lord to do that? Or is that what you're expecting? Is that what your instincts is going, I need to do this because God's a recipe and I, I know that if I do X, Y, Z, he'll, he'll produce what I want. See, God likes to change our way of thinking. God likes to change the formula for us so we don't get habitual. And I remember when I shared last time that God is a relationship. And see, we can get into formulas so then our relationships become stale. And we don't want a stale relationship like a bride chasing a bridegroom. You don't want your bridegroom to just simply just go, oh, well, I know you're there. I know if I cook your breakfast, you'll be happy. That's it. I don't, need a, I don't need to spend the long days chatting with you. I don't need to do these things. 
But you see, God desires us and he's designed us to have a relation, to have a communion with God. See, Simon Peter had a realization. He had a realization of who God was. But because you say, I'll do that what you're asking. And how do we get a realization? See, we need to be a person, we need to be a people that can seek God's word for what we're doing in our circumstance and not going, oh, okay, well, I have a need, so, yep, I'm going to go pray. All right, God, you're going to do it, you're going to do it, sweet, done. All right, thank you, Jesus, you're going to give me exactly what I want. And then when it doesn't happen, going, what the heck? Like, why haven't you done it? I prayed, I did the things that you told me I thought I should do. But see, the word of the Lord is different. The word of the Lord, when he comes and tells you exactly what to do, he gives you a heavenly blueprint. He says, this, my child, is what I desire from you. This, my child, is what I seek. And we can see that playing out. And if we go to the next scripture, well, actually, before we do, I actually want to touch on this, because straight after Simon Peter got what he wanted, he had, again, the conviction of the Lord hit him because he realized who Jesus was in his fullness. And then he said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And then Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for men. Or you'll fish for people, depending on your translation. See, God now gave him a new identity. See, his old identity was a fisherman, but now God's given him a new identity. So in our needs of want and in our needs of trying to seek God in our, in our things. See, God wants to bring a breakthrough into our situation. And maybe, yes, you've been trying the formula that you've set out, but now God wants to speak into it and God wants to tell you to do it so that then it can bring breakthrough so then that you have the change of belief so that your identity isn't found in what you're doing, but your identity is found in Him. See, now if we go to the next, the next parable, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. See, while Jesus was on the way of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. He saw Jesus and fell on his face and to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing. And he touched it, and as soon as he did, he became clean. See, maybe you're searching for a healing. Maybe you're seeking God for, for a healing or desiring God for a healing. And this is where we know that leper, lepers weren't allowed in the town, so he was outcasted. He was on the outskirts of the town. And maybe you've been feeling like you're not included. Maybe you've been feeling like you're on the outskirts of the community. Maybe it feels like no one's really around anymore. But Jesus is coming. And you see, we don't know how long the leprous man had been walking around, if he had been trying to find Jesus. We don't know if he was just simply walking by and just saw Jesus. But the thing I do know is he had a realization of who Christ was. And he said, God, you know that you can do this. I know that you can do this, but if you're willing. See, he didn't waver his faith and go, God, you are God, but if you don't do it, I might not believe in you tomorrow. Or I might get angry. He just said, God, I know you can, and if you're willing, you will. See, this is a beautiful picture of maybe in this situation or maybe in this need, this is a time that you can search for Jesus, that you can go on the outskirts, get away, be, be taken away from the crowd that you've been hanging around and go and seek him and be on your face before him and go, God, I know who you are, and you are, I, if you are willing, you will help me. And then, but not waver from disbelief and go, God, but why aren't you doing it? Why, why, why? But simply just setting in the fact and resting in it and going, I know you can. I know you will because you're a loving God. And giving him the choice, giving him that responsibility because it's not up to us to choose whether God shows up or he doesn't. It's purely God because we don't know what God has planned for our lives. We just know that he's a good father and that he will meet our needs and meet us where we're at always because he loves us. He designed, he's designed to have a relationship with us and we're designed to have communion with him. And when we sit there and search him and go, God, I know you can do it, but if you're willing, can you please? And he just sits down and simply whispers, I am willing. So maybe you're in this situation where you're looking for God in your situation and you, you haven't really been praying. Maybe you haven't been asking the Lord what you're, what you're what his heart in the situation is. And maybe this is a call to go into that prayer closet, go on your face before him and go, God, I know you can if you're willing. We heard some amazing testimonies before where God was willing. 
See, God is always willing. It's just our disbelief that can get in the way of it. And maybe it's not the time right now, but it could be in the future because God never changes. It's only us that changes. See, God wants to meet us. God wants to heal us. But the moment that we start going, God, why isn't it happening? God, I'm sick of this. Do not see me. God knows where you're at. God sees your heart. God knows exactly the circumstances you're in. But God, we have to remember that scripture. God always works things out for good for those that love him. And we just have to hold to that identity of God, you are good. God, you will do it. And if you're willing, you can. Because I know you are the, the God of gods. I know that you are the Christ. And not letting our, our disbelief waver whether God comes right then as we expect. Because we can get needy. I know I'm very needy. I need Jesus all the time. And when I feel like I'm not getting him, I'm going, oh, I, have, I, tuck, I chuck a little tantrum. I'm like, God, come on, why aren't you here? And he's like, I am. I'm like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Just me? No? Okay. See, it's, it's that unwavering faith of going, God, I know who you are, and if you're willing, you can, you can do this. We look at the next, the next parable. It's the Jesus with the paralyzed man. I'm going to paraphrase this one just because I love this scripture so much. These friends have a, have a friend that's paralyzed. They can't get to Jesus because Jesus is in a crowd of people. And they can't seem to get to him. There's no way to find Jesus. Maybe you're in a situation right now where it seems impossible to find Jesus. Maybe you're in a situation where you can't see Jesus at all. And it doesn't seem like you're even going to get to him, get near him to even get the healing or the, or the request that you want to him. But then you see the beautiful part about these people is that they had an unwavering faith and that they made a way. So maybe in the situation that you're in, you, want to, you need to break through and make a way with your faith. Just as Alan shared before and Tom shared the last week that we need to contend for our faith. So maybe we need to sit there and you need to contend for your faith. Maybe when they got up, see they got up onto the roof and they started ripping up the tiles, and they started ripping up the roof. So maybe you need to rip up some old habits in your life. Maybe you need to rip up some old thoughts in your life. Maybe you need to rip up the old protection that was once holding you and break through it so you can lay it down at the feet of Jesus. See, they got Jesus, and they got, they got right to where they wanted the paralytic man. And Jesus looked at them and said, because of their faith, I will make you well, and your sins are forgiven. See, when we can make a way, when there seems no way, God will come. Maybe we can break through our old thinking. Maybe we can break through what's been holding us bound. See, the moment that Jesus healed the paralytic man, he said, pick up your mat and walk and go home. See, the paralytic man took a hold of what was once holding him. And that's why Christ says to take thought, take your thoughts captive. Take your imaginations and your thoughts captive under the submission of Christ. See, maybe you need to stop getting out of your mind and out of this disbelief and out of these things that you keep making up. Well, you could have looked at the crowd and you could have simply gone, oh, well, there's too many people. Like, we've got this guy, we've got to carry him. It's seen, oh, there's, there's no way that we're going to get to Jesus. It seems impossible. See, but that's when your faith can come in. And you go, well, I don't see a way, but God, I know you can make a way. And if I, if I can't see it, I'm going to declare it. And I'm going to rip up all the old disbelief. I'm going to rip up all the old things that have been hindering me so that I can lay it down at the feet of God and that you can meet me and then you can say, be healed. That you can meet me in my situation and that you can say, let it be walked so that the old can be done so I can take a hold of what used to hold me and make it walk with me and not I be walking with it. See, that's what God wants us to do because sometimes hail comes and sometimes after that a flood comes. Or if we look at 2019 or 2020, it was a fire and then a flood and then it was COVID, I think. It was just one thing after the other and it seemed like it was never letting up. And then that's when we can try and take firm hold of belief of what God has told us. Because like I said before, God is not a man that he shall lie. 
So every word will come back to him. It will not pass him in or make it void. He makes sure that it is fulfilled. So that when we are finding ourselves in this situation of unbelief, when we're finding ourselves in a situation where it seems like it's not going to end, there's no way to Jesus, and there's no way that I could find breakthrough in my situation, that we can make the way, that we can declare the scriptures, that we can just begin to rise up every morning and start to go, no, you are a good God, you will make it happen because I know that you will say, you say it will be done. And you say in your word that you will heal. You say that you are a good God. You say that you will plan all things for good that those that love you. I thank you, Jesus, that you will do it. So then that we can stand in faith and not let our disbelief in our minds come in because the moment we let the enemy come in, he will begin to rule our thoughts. And then one thing comes after the other and then you're in an avalanche of thoughts. You're going, oh, well, then there's this problem and then there's this problem and actually there's this problem. You know what? It actually wasn't possible. I should have listened to the people because, yeah, they're right. There's like five things now that are, oh, and there's this one. And you start going on this little tangent of disbelief and then you start ruling it back and then you go, oh, well, God, you don't even really love me and are you even here? And then you just start going downhill. But then when you can try and take a hold of what the things that were holding you and you can take them and go, no, God, no, no, God, you're a good God. You say that it will happen. You say that there will be breakthrough. You say that you will meet me. You say that if I seek you, that I will find you. You say that you will be a healer because the blind eyes will be open, the deaf ears will hear, and that the the lame will walk so I can trust in you and those that trust in you will not be put to shame for the Lord is good and that you can begin to declare that and make breakthrough in your situation and not let the devil start hounding you and put you in disbelief so that you stay bound on the mat and that you never even get to the feet of Jesus to allow him the opportunity to heal you or your situation so straight after that again he takes hold of what was holding him and see now he's got a new identity before he was the paralytic man, now he's the man jumping and praising Jesus. Because immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Now he's the man that praises God. He's not the man bound by the mat. So straight after this parable, again, I just saw this little pattern, and we're going to go to Luke 7 soon, but there's a little pattern. We have, we have Peter, who had, to have an, who had to have a surrender, and he had to have an obedience. We had the leprous man who knew who Christ was and he was laying at his feet. He searched for God and laid at his feet for his need. Then we have the paralytic man who made a way to find Christ, who found a way in his situation. And then straight after, we have this beautiful little picture of when Jesus calls Levi, or as people might know him as Matthew. See, after Jesus went out, he saw a tax collector by Levi sitting at his tax booth and said, Follow me. Very simple word. And Jesus said to him, and Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus. See, maybe you're in this transition of your life and you feel like you're bound by this job because Levi was a tax collector. He was bound in this little booth. He was bound by what he thought he knew. He, he was bound by the work he was living. He was bound by the life that he was got portioned to him and he had chosen. And maybe God's saying, follow me. Maybe it looks scary. You don't know what that looks like. Levi was a very wealthy man. Being a tax collector, he had a lot of money. But Jesus is saying, follow me. Jesus is a, practically a homeless man that just is a nomad ro ro rolling down the streets. But yet Levi realized who was speaking to him. And he said, yes, I will follow you. So he left everything. He left everything behind and followed Christ. Then out of the innermost of Levi's heart held a banquet, feasted with Jesus, communed with Jesus, celebrated with Jesus, drank with Jesus. See, when we have our faith and we leave the old behind, we give it all to God so that we can dine with him so that we can drink of his goodness, that we can stand firm in who he is. And as Tom shared last week, that by accounting the testimonies of who Christ is, by accounting the things that he's done in our life, will bring us to remembrance of knowing what he can do. See that when we, when we know and we dine with Jesus, 
That's when the goodness will well up. That's when we will understand who Christ is. That's when we can have the obedience and have the faith to surrender and lay it all down at his feet and know that it will be made well because Christ said so, because he has told you so. There is plenty, plenty, plenty of testimonies where God has told you to do something or Todd has told people to lay it all down, to follow him, to go somewhere. That seems scary, but God knows the plan and we have to remember God's got a bird eye view. It's like being at the edge of a cliff and then not knowing what was underneath it and God saying, jump. And you're like, oh, that's scary. But he's like, there's pillows underneath, like the gigantic, you're going to land in beautiful water. It's going to be fine. But we don't see that. But God can see that. That's why he will say, do it. God is such a beautiful, amazing God that he actually knows what, believe it or not, he knows the beginning to the end. So if he's telling you to do it, it's because he knows what's going to happen. It's not because he's just winging it going, oh, well, I told him to do that. I hope that goes well. He's not, he's not like your, your, your friend at 12 o'clock at night offering you advice about your situation. You know, he's not the guy that's like, oh, well, yeah, do that. I shouldn't have given him that advice. Oh. Well, the best. <laughs> God, God actually knows what he's doing. Do you guys believe that? He actually knows what he's doing. When he tells you to do something, it's because he's already planned it out. It's not, he's not making it up as he goes. He's actually planned it. That's why we walk accordance to his steps and he will make the path straight as long as we submit to him. See, now if we go to Luke chapter 7, there's another beautiful picture of faith. Everyone knows this story oh so well. I feel like everyone does know all these stories because these are beautiful, beautiful pictures. See, Jesus, again, was walking through the town and these elders had come up to him and said, there's a great man who is well deserving of this healing. He's... he's his person is getting, needs healing right now, and he's well-deserving of it. You should go and do it. He's, he, he loves our land. He, he, he actually even built the synagogues. And Jesus was like, okay, I'm going to go. And he moved and went to go heal him. But see, the centurion actually realized and knew who was coming to his house. He had a realization of Jesus and the man that he was. So he didn't even go out and see him. He actually sent people to go talk to Jesus and say, I'm not worthy of you to have have you under my roof. But see, I'm a man of authority. So you say the word and it will be done. See, the beautiful thing about this, if we look at John as well, this story in John, Jesus' first ever miracle was in Capernaum. And he turned the water into the wine at the wedding feast. We all know that one. And it speaks of the covenant and how instead of a ceremony washing on the outside, that it's now going to be a washing on the inside from the blood of Christ. But it also, prophetically speaking, talks about how God, and what we heard Tom prophesy to us before, is saving the best move of God till last. He saves the best till last. Then he went away and he comes back to Capernaum. This is the second time visiting Capernaum, and then he finds faith. So much so that Jesus is marveled or in some translation, is amazed. We can amaze Jesus with our faith. That's an astonishing thought. We can amaze God. And it says in the word also that when God comes back, will he find faith on the earth? And this is Jesus coming back round too. And he's finding such a faith that he's marveling. So that's a picture for us to be going, are we going to be a bride of Christ that we will give such faith and have such faith in any circumstance that Jesus will marvel? That we can know the God that we serve, that he doesn't even need to be present. He just needs to say the word and it'll bring breakthrough. It'll bring healing to all that is listening, to all that is around. And maybe you're standing in the gap for someone as we did last weekend. We stood in the gap for our beloved. We stood in the gap for our loved ones to bring healing on them. And that we stood in faith just like the centurion and just said, Jesus, you are a man of authority and that you say the word and it will be done. And that we can stand in the gap of people and the others and the ones that we love and say, Jesus, let it be done. And that that will bring healing to our circumstance or bring healing to our loved ones and know that with our faith and our unwavering faith, that knowing that Jesus doesn't even need to turn up, but he will make it so because we have spoken it. See, we are co-creators with Christ. 
and that he has given us all authority on heaven and on earth so that now that we have that authority, it's up to us to steward that authority and speak into situations and believe that God will touch that person or touch the other person that's coming. See, the, the funny thing about this is that I don't read anywhere that that, that servant actually knew that they were getting prayed for, but yet they woke up well this moment that Jesus spoke it. See, we need to be a people that have such unwavering faith that when we hear God speak and say it will be so, that we can believe and hold firm onto that and be like, God, you don't even need to be present. You're a man. of You are the God of gods. You created the heaven, the earth, and the seas, and everything in it. And know that it will be done. Straight afterwards, we see Jesus raising the widow's son. I love this picture. It's such a beautiful, beautiful story. See, Jesus went to a town called Naon, and his disciples were in a, large, in a large crowd with him. And as they approached the town and the gate, a dead person was being carried out. It was the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, saying, don't cry. <sighs> Jesus cares. Maybe something's died in your life. Maybe it's a someone, but maybe something has died in your life. Maybe a passion, maybe a gift that God gave you. Maybe it's even a prophetic word spoken over you, but you've let it die. Or maybe it just died because of all the things that were going on in life, and it's just you can't see it happening at all. It's just not going to happen. But you've had this spoken to you. It once was alive. It once was there. You could tangibly, physically see it, but now it's dead. And now you're mourning over the loss because it was the only thing that was holding you. Maybe it was the only thing that was keeping you. Maybe it was the only thing you felt God really portioned to you. But Jesus says, don't cry. Because Jesus touched the young child and said, get up. And the child got up and they were all filled with awe. So maybe there's a part of you that has been dead. And Jesus wants to speak to it today and say, it's not dead. It's about to get up. It's about to come back alive because it once was dead and it did die. But now I'm coming back and telling you, no, it's going to be alive and it's going to be better than ever because my heart, not because of your faith, but because of my heart, because that is something that I gave you and my heart is breaking for you in your circumstance. And God wants it to say, get up. Because he doesn't want it to die more than you don't want it to die. Maybe you've just been like, it's done, it's gone. Jesus, look, that's not a thing anymore. It once was, but it's all right now. But Jesus is going, no, get up. It's going to come. It's coming back to life. And I want to see it back to life. It's not because you don't have the faith. It's because I gave that to you. And I want to see it happen. I am the one that wants to see it happen. Then straight after this beautiful picture... We have Jesus and John the Baptist. And we all know Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins. They were, had a beautiful relationship. And see, if you guys don't know the context behind this little scripture, John went to jail. And, you know, being your cousin, you'd expect your cousin to come and visit you. But Jesus actually went the opposite direction of when John went to jail. So he, it's like your cousin just went to Brisbane jail and then you're going, all right, well, I'm going for a quick drive up to Sundays, and staying up there for the whole time. And they're going, where the heck is he? See, maybe you feel like you're confined in prison. Maybe you feel like there's something holding you. Maybe you feel trapped. Maybe you feel like Jesus isn't around. He's gone the other direction. Maybe you feel so uncomfortable, so alone in this situation. You're wondering, God, are you even here? God, it feels like you've packed your bags on purpose and gone the other direction. See, <laughs> this is an amazing thing because John actually sends out disciples to go and see Jesus, to sort after him, and says, go ask Jesus, is he the one he says he is? So John the Baptist was fighting disbelief. John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, heard God speak to Jesus, started questioning is God God? Is he really who we say he is? Because he went through this time of trial. 
He was in this time of confinement, a time of refining, a time where he felt like he was trapped and burdened. And then Jesus simply says, go back and report to John all the good things that I'm doing. All the good things. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. And then straight after he says this, he says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. See, it's this beautiful picture that's getting overlaid throughout all those little parables or those little stories of Jesus going and healing. Don't let your faith be wavered whether Jesus comes or he doesn't because he is God. He is coming. It's just not in the time you expect. There's a great story, and I love it so much. I can't remember where in the Gospels it is, but it's there somewhere. I'm sure if you go find it, you'll find it. And they say, Jesus, the one you love is dead. And Jesus, I just picture it like this. Jesus is sitting down, and this person runs up, and they're like, Jesus, the one you love is dead. And he's just, he's down, he stands up, and he goes, this will not end in death, but this will be to glorify God. And then he sits back down, and, never, and then he just starts chilling. Everyone's like, I thought you were going to get up and everyone was ready to march and go and just, just shakabundi, like Neil says, and see, it raised the dead, but he just sat back down and started chilling. And everyone's like, wait, wait, but he's dead. Jesus, we, we need to go. He's like, no, he's just asleep. We don't need to go. See, and that's like the thing, like we expect Jesus to get up straight away because the one he loved, which is all of us, is in trouble that is burdened, but Jesus stays chilling because he wants to make sure that you know it was not your own strength. He wants to make sure you know that it had nothing to do with you and it was all him. So that when he comes on the fourth day, when it's past human or possibilities or even in traditional rites that you might have formed around your thinking, that Jesus breaks through and tells the dead to rise so that when it happens, you definitely know, okay, that was nothing to do with me. All glory to you, God. See, and that's the, that's the thing God wants to do. He, he likes to stack the odds against himself to prove that he is God. And it's also so that we can have a deeper trust of our bridegroom, of our lover, and have this trust. Because if our trust is dependent on getting everything every time we want it, then it's not trust. It's an expectation receiving very fast. And it's, it's just, again, it's just this amazing, amazing relationship. It's like the tango. Jesus is in lead. And you just need to say, Jesus, let's dance today. And you let go of control because I don't know if you guys have ever danced before. And if the girl starts to try to lead and you're trying to lead, I had this experience with someone. I don't know who. And they try to lead, it makes it awkward because these guys go, hey, I want to go this way, I want to go that way. And they're trying to lead you two different directions. And that's what we do with Christ sometimes without even knowing. We're like, Jesus, we want to go this way. And he's like, no, this way. And then you're like, no, this way. And you start forming this little wrestle with God and you don't even know you're doing it. So that's when we need to surrender, have that realization that Jesus is Christ that he knows best, have the obedience to trust in him and do what he's saying. And then have the faith that he will come through and see that he will do it. Then the way that it's unraveled again, see we had had the three forms of faith in, in John 5, then finished off with communing, dining with God, that intimacy with Jesus. Then again, in Luke 7, we have three forms of faith. Then again, the communion with Jesus. See, in Luke 7, 36, Jesus was anointed by, by a sinful woman, as it says. And where Jesus is, he's in a Pharisee's house. He's in a man of high prestige. And this woman comes in a very sinful woman so obviously she was known by the town as a not a godly person she was despised by people and 
She comes into the presence of these godly men and they all look at her and go, what are you doing here? And she starts crying at the feet of Jesus. Again, cracks this perfume of nard that was over a year's wage. Again, giving everything to God, pouring everything out to Jesus at his feet, crying. And you see the thing about it as well is she had her hair down, wiping his feet. And in that culture, women weren't allowed to have their hair down. It was always tied up. So maybe you just need to let your hair down. Maybe you just need to stop being so religious. Maybe you just need to stop thinking that it's got to be a certain way. Maybe you just got to stop trying to lead Jesus and tell him where he should go and actually surrender and just do the dance, do the tango, and just have some fun with it. Well, God, oh, it looks like I'm not getting out of this one. I've really dug myself a hole like I've got no money. I'm in the middle of Calcutta. No food. I trust you. You've got you're gonna, to you're gonna do something cool this one. Like, I have no way of even thinking about how you're going to do it. See, when we have that faith in our bridegroom, in our husband to provide for us, in our Father to look after us, that's when we can rest easy in the storm, just like Jesus was. He was sleeping on the boat. He had not a care in the world. And that's because he knew who he was. He knew what he was capable of. So when can we know what God's capable of? Pour everything at his feet. Leave everything at his feet. Maybe this is a call for you. Maybe you've been holding parts of your heart back. Maybe you've been holding something back. Oh, God, I don't want to give you that. It's too expensive. It cost me too much to get me where I was. It cost me too much to do this, to get this. But Jesus wants you to break it. Pour it on his feet so there's no coming back. Just as Levi did, he left everything behind. Peter left everything behind and followed him, followed his voice calling him, saying, follow me. And he, she wept at the feet of Jesus. See, Jesus cares. I don't know about you, but I think Jesus knows what you're going through. He actually sees what's in the inside of your heart. So when you go to him and you just go, oh, God, everything's so good. I thank you. He's like, oh, you're lying to me. Imagine going home after a really bad day for all those that have a husband and a wife and your, your, your wife walks in and you're like, how's your day? And she's quivering and lips going and tears are trying. She's really good. Really good. Yep, couldn't be better. Thank you. You're amazing. You're amazing. What can I do for you? Can I just go serve you? Can I do something for you? See, the, the husband's heart in that situation is going, no, stop. Tell me your heart. I want you to release it. I want you to, to take that burden away so you can give it over to me so I can hear it and carry it with you. Because I don't want you to hold that so then that you're a mess later and break when you spill your iced chocolate and then you start crying and then everything comes out and you're like, what's going on? everything's falling down and everything's breaking and nothing's happening and you know, you're, just, you're just crying on the inside. See, see, Jesus just wants you to just go to his feet. Let it out. Let your hair down. Just be real with God. So many people try to cover what they're feeling to God, but God knows your thoughts. You guys know that? He knows your thoughts. He's numbered the hairs on your head. He actually knows you better than you know yourself. So when you're trying to muster up the courage to go to God and say, actually, I'm doing way better than you think, it doesn't work. He's like, oh, sure. <laughs> oh, let me try. But he, he just desires us to have such an intimate relationship with him that we can cry, we can be vulnerable, we can let everything out to Christ and know that it's, not forsaken. We know that we don't give it, and that's it. See, no, nothing pleases God more than faith. 
It says that those that do not have God, faith cannot please God because those that believe must know that he is a one that rewards those who diligently seek him. So why do we sit here and try to pretend everything's all good to an all-knowing, all-omnipresent God when he can see into your heart and just wants you to release it? Because straight after that scripture, he says, your sins are forgiven. It's like, whoa, she just poured her heart out. She didn't even ask for forgiveness. She just poured her heart out. She had a realization of who, whose feet she was at. And she was forgiven. And her faith saved her, so she was able to go in peace. And this is the beautiful thing about God, is that he doesn't require anything from us but he does desire a real relationship with us because he is alive. He is real. He's not a statue on your wall that's deaf and does not speak and does not eat. Jesus Christ is alive. He desires to hold you intimately. And you know what? Maybe, maybe you're sick and tired of trying to pretend it's okay, but this is a call for you to sit at the king's feet, to sit at his feet and just worship him and to know who he is. Because God is a loving God and he wants to see you be set free. He wants to see you with no chains, the shackles broken, so you can go forth and take hold of what was holding you and start praising God. See, we need a realization of who we serve. So then that when he speaks, that we have the surrender to able to lay it at his feet, break it, pour, it, pour out our hearts, give everything over to Christ, so then that when he says it, we have the obedience to do what he says because we have the faith from the realization and the knowledge of who Christ is, so that when we do it, he will meet us where we're at and he will bring breakthrough into our situation. It's as simple as that. It's not need, normally needing to do X, Y, and Z, but it's just knowing who he is. And that only comes out of a place of intimacy. And maybe you are sitting here today and going, well, I have tried all the things and nothing works. Like I'm sick of hearing these stories on faith, but yet... I've got faith the size of a mustard seed. I should be able to move mountains. But yet God just wants your heart and wants you to trust him. Maybe you need to lay it at his feet. Maybe you're still trying to take control of it. Because maybe you're trying to control the situation without even knowing because you're trying to pray the exact prayer that you want and telling God how he should do it. See, we need to just let it go. Break it. Pour it at the feet of Jesus and watch him bring breakthrough. Break through that old thinking and start declaring the truth of God so we can rip up our old beliefs, rip up what we used to know, and then bring it to Jesus and give it to him so he can say, pick up your mat and walk. Pick up that situation, throw it away. Go to him and say, God, are you willing? And he says, yes, I am. Because we're spending too long walking our life without Christ in intimacy. Because only from intimacy of Christ will the flow of living waters flow from us so that we can impart life to others. And that's what Christ desires most. Now, I don't know what anyone is going through here. Maybe you have been going through a financial crisis. Maybe you have been trying to seek God in a situation, but it seems like you've got nothing. Maybe you have been feeling like you're excluded. You're on the outside of everything and no one's even communicating. They've shunned you and you're just searching for Jesus to fall at his feet and cry to God. 
Maybe you haven't even, even sought God after your situation. And this is a call to come before him, the holy throne of God, and lay your request at his feet and just cry and be real with God. Or maybe you've been seeking after a healing that has been taking so long and you haven't seen anything come through and you just want to give it to God so God can give you breakthrough for your situation. And I'll tell you right now that Jesus wants to meet you where you're at and bring breakthrough to your situation. He wants to see you healed. He wants to see you set free. And he wants to bring you out of deliverance, out of that captivity that you've been holding yourself in and show you that he is Christ. So if that is you today, please, please come out. Let us believe for you. Let us pray for you. and Let us believe God for your situation. Maybe you even, again, like last week, want to stand in the gap for a loved one. And just like the centurion, believe that God will say it will be done so it will be done and not waver from faith and just say, God, you are a God of your word, and you will say it will be done. And with my faith, I will say that it will be done with you, and I will agree, and we will partner, and then that we will see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, and we will give you praise and give you glory, because we know it was only you. So now I can pick up that old thing that was holding me, and pick up that old thought pattern that I used to have, and rip it up, and rip it out of my life, and take hold of it, so now I can go off jumping and leaping and praising God for who he is. So Father, we thank you for that. If that is you today, please come, come to the front and let's believe God for you. And whatever your request is, let it be known to God with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving in your heart. And let's just believe for breakthrough. So Father, we, we thank you that your presence is here, God. I thank you that all those that are desiring to seek you more intimately, to have a revelation of who you are, Christ. I thank you all those that are seeking healing, that are seeking breakthrough, that are seeking something from you, God, that there will be breakthrough in the name of Jesus, that there will be the power of God released. Your anointing will be released today. So, Father, I thank you that all those that are seeking after you, seeking something from you, seeking after your heart will just come and lay at your feet, lay their requests before you, and believe in you, and you alone. Thank you, Holy Ghost.